Hi, everybody, and welcome to Adler Astronomy Live. My name is Meredith. I am your host, and today we're going to be talking about sundials. So as many of you know, the Adler Planetarium is currently closed to the public, so we're looking for ways to bring some of our fun programming online to you. And one of the things we love about the Adler is our amazing collections and our historical artifacts. So we're trying to bring some of those to you today. But as you can see, we're not in the Adler. We're all just in our own personal homes. I've got my spooky Halloween decorations up. You know, we're just doing what we can. And because of that, uh, you know, we, you might see some technical difficulties or perhaps somebody's pet or child jumping into the camera. For those reasons, we just ask for your patience and understanding, and we hope that you are ready to have some fun. Okay, with us today, we have a special guest, Dr. Shara Schechner. Dr. Sarah Schechner. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Hi, Meredith. How are you? I'm great. Where are you joining us from? I'm joining from just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Yay. How often do you get introduced when somebody says Shara Schechner? <laughs> Well, <laughs> it's a tricky name to pronounce, <laughs> but that was be. a new one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, hey, there's a first for everything. Uh, with us, we also have our very own Pedro Raposo. Hi, Pedro. Hello, Meredith and everyone. Hi, um, Pedro is our curator and director of collections at the Adler and Sarah is the David P. Wheatland curator of the collection of historical scientific instruments at Harvard University. So welcome to both of you. I'm so excited. We're gonna be talking about sundials and uh, today's program is meant to be totally interactive, which means we want to hear from you. So please utilize the chat function in YouTube. Robert is gonna be joining you in the chat and Robert will get your questions over to us. So please say hi to Robert and feel free to ask questions all throughout our programming. That's what this program is all about. And there are no silly questions. So please ask them. Uh, all right. I think that we are ready to get started. So we're talking about sundials. Why don't you just explain what makes a sundial? What does a sundial do? Yeah, sure. So sundials are time finding instruments. So they are designed for finding the time from the sun. They played an extremely important role in shaping our sense and our understanding of time. And they've been around for a long time. The oldest sundials we know of are from ancient Egypt and they are more than 3000 years old. In a sundial, there are two main features that will, you, will always, you can always expect to find. One is some kind of hour scale where you will actually read the time. And the other is what we call the gnomon. That spells G-N-O-M-O-N. -O -O the gnomon is the piece that will cast a shadow on the hour scale when your sundial is set and when it is exposed to the sun. So these are the main features, but sundials come in the most varied shapes and forms and designs. And at the other planetarium, we have one of the most comprehensive collections of sundials in the world, and certainly, uh, the best collections of sundials in the United States. And so today we will talk about some of the different, uh, the different types of sundials that exist. Right now you can see just three examples from our collections. Uh, and so we will get to see by uh, looking at some of these examples, how sundials have been historically so important. These are amazing and they're all so wildly different looking. Like I can tell that they function differently too. So why do sundials come in so many different varied forms? Well, sundials come in lots of forms because they were made for people who had different needs and different belief systems and um, different senses of taste. So for example, just like the fashion of Paris, New York, and Japan is different today. So did sundials come in different fashions. And then today, just like if you lived in a rural or North Woods kind of area, you're, or had a kind of job that needed um, a truck, your most common vehicle for transportation would be say a pickup truck, where if you were living in suburbia, you probably had a car that was family friendly. And sundials do this too. So we have ones that were made near the coastline in France, and they have special features to find the times of high tide. Other ones point out religious festivals and ways to find the dates of Easter for those who wanted to know that. Um, and then we also have sundials that come 
for different pocketbooks. So if you're rich, you might have a sundial made of gilt brass or silver or ivory. If you're of the middle class, you might have one of brass or wood. And if you were a shepherd, there was a whole nother type for you. It's made of simple wood and a particular style. So there's ones that come to suit everybody's different pocketbooks as well. That's amazing. So we're talking, we have an amazing collection of sundials at the Adler from all over the world. And we actually have somebody asking a question, which they want to know where in the world are there other outstanding collections of sundials? Mm -hmm. Well, um, while the Chicago collection, I would say is the best collection in North <gasps> America. And it's really a privilege to have been able to work with it. The largest collection of sundials is at Harvard University in the collection of historical scientific instruments where I am the curator. But there are large collections of sundials, excellent collections um, in London, in Italy, in various places. Um, uh, like Florence and Rome and Milan, um, their collections um, in Germany. So there are these wonderfully large collections um, around the world. Amazing. Have you gotten to see a lot of them, Sarah? I have, and that's been a lot of fun to <laughs> go, go look at it's always fun as a curator to go behind the scenes in someone else's museum yes. <laughs> and, and uh, come up and see what they have. And all these things are handmade. So it's not like we're used to industrial production where every, you know, every pot by the same maker is going to look like every other pot by that maker where as sundials, these are all, beautifully constructed one by one um, by artisans. And um, most of them were made before early mass production techniques. So each one of these is its own character. Yeah. I, I, I love that. And okay, so we have these three amazing ones right in front of us. Let's kind of dive into each one of these. Um, starting with this first one with the sun face on it. Can we talk about what this sundial is and how it works? Yeah, sure. So this is what we call a diptych sundial. The word diptych refers to the fact that, as you can see in the picture, the sundial is formed by two hinged tablets. You can actually close it, you carry it around, and then you can open it up, and you place the two tablets at the right angle to use the sundial. In this case, the gnomon, uh, as you might be able to see in the image, is, uh, or at least the main gnomon, because there are different uh, devices uh, in, in the same piece. The main gnomon is a string with, which is stretched between the two tablets. And you see on the lower tablet, there's a round recess, which originally would have contained a compass. So the compass is very important because you will need it to align your sundial with the local north-south line, which we call a meridian. So this particular example was made in the late 17th century in the German city of Nuremberg, and it's made out of ivory. Of course, nowadays, there are many restrictions in place uh, with regard to the trade of ivory goods, and rightly so, because the ivory trade put elephants at the risk of extinction. But in the 16th and uh, 17th centuries, when these sundials were very fashionable, this was the time when European powers were engaging with uh, projects of maritime expansion that ultimately gave rise to the modern colonial empires. So there was a great influx of ivory coming into Europe, especially from Africa. And so ivory was perceived as a fine uh, and exotic material and much appreciated for different kinds of decorative pieces and works of art and instruments as well. So in Nuremberg, this kind of diptych sundial, where the two tablets or leaves are made out of ivory, this became the hallmark of the sundial makers based in Nuremberg. Because this kind of sundial includes also a compass, they were known as compass makers. 
Wow, this is incredible. And looking at it, it's it's beautiful. The design is gorgeous. And I'm just wondering about this sun face and all these markings and if they're functional or if they're all, you know, kind of half functional, half decorative. How do those work? Well, almost all of those things, except for the flowers and the sun face, are functional instruments. So if we start at the very top, there is a little pin sticking out, which is a gnomon, and we see like a fan of lines coming down and some curvy lines going across them. Well, that's a, a sundial that is showing um, not only um, the sun's position in the zodiac, but also the lengths of day, light, and darkness for every day of the calendar year, which was useful to travelers if they want to know when the sun is going to set and how much time they have to do the business. Then below that, we have a vertical sundial um, that's telling common hours. And on the lower leaf, using the same string gnomon, we have a horizontal sundial that's telling common hours. These are hours that, like we use today, where we count one to 12 twice and 12 o'clock is at noon or at midnight. But then below that, you see some crisscrossing lines and another pin sticking up. And those are two more sundials. One is telling time in Italian hours, which counts one to 24 starting at sunset. And the other is telling time in Babylonian or what are known as Nuremberg hours counting one to 24 starting at sunrise. So we have several different methods of finding the time on this sundial. And it depended if you were in England and France, you'd use the common hours. If you're in Italy, you'd use the Italian hours. If you were in um, Greece, you'd use the Babylonian hours. If you were in Germany, you'd use the Nuremberg hours. So we have a sense of, there's not just one way to tell the time, which tells us how culturally dependent time is and the ways that we divide the day are uh, while using the natural source of the sun, there's nothing really natural about our choice to divide these things up. They come from various uh, cultural and political histories. Yeah, this is amazing. And and so have you you just covered so many things that are included in the sundial. Is that everything or is there more? But this... yo, there's more. <laughs> uh, on the two sides we're not seeing when you close it up, there's um other features. Wow. Uh, this is the top and um here you see um a brass uh, index, it looks like a pointing hand, which I just love. And that's part of a wind vane that would spin around on the top. Um, and it would uh, point to the direction of the winds, which are marked on this compass rose, this wind rose you see under it with all those spiky points. And then in the words around the outside of that ring are weather forecasts. So this also told you not only the direction of the wind, but what kind of weather to expect, whether you were getting snow or hot and humid weather. So this is also very multifunctional. That's incredible. This, it, would you consider this a computer? Is this device kind of a, an ancient computer in a way? Well, I think a better example is a, um, like a smartphone today, these things find the time, but they do a lot more. And, um, and so that was often a, um, a reason people liked them. You know, when you see all these things on them, you wonder, well, was time really the most important thing about it? Um, certainly was one function, just like our smartphones, we use them for making telephone calls. But we like to show off all the other features and apps as we'd call them. Here, the sundial has just been turned over and we see a, what's known as a lunar volvo, which is a rotating disc that set, tells you the phases of the moon, which allows you among other things to, um, to use the sundial by moonlight. So this gives you the conversion of sunlight to moonlight time reading. 
Wow. Okay. Somebody's asking a great question. Did they sell these sundials with little instruction books or did they just expect the buyer to figure out how to use it? <laughs> Cause it seems a little complicated. That's a great question. And for, I've never seen an instruction book for these kind of diptych sundials. There are some, um, sundials of a different sort known as Augsburg type where there are they were more produced in greater numbers and they did have instruction books that sometimes survive with them and the Adler collection actually has a few of them which we've reproduced um, in the catalog um, and the, and these instructions are in multiple languages too, so often in French and German, which tells us who they were selling to. Um, but often there are no instructions in that associate with these sundials that are in the form of a manual that would have come with it. Wow, amazing. Okay, we're getting a couple of spooky questions. I think people are um, a little bit inspired by maybe my Halloween decorations. But somebody wants to know, are there any simple sundials that can be made for graves? Sure, sure you could. Um, you know, it's really determined um, uh, how you put the gravestone and you could, if the gravestone is oriented well you could you could be oriented any way you want and there would be a type of sundial you could put on it and um, on the other hand we'll see later sundials often had spooky um, reminders of death on them to mm -hmm. tell people to not waste time and use the time wisely so those are um, so you have sundials to remind people of the future grave and you could have a sundial made on a grave um, for passers-by to think about time and yes. it's passing. So interesting to correlate those two but somebody else made a comment saying the sundial in the shape of a cross is very appropriate for a tomb and there are already several like that around the world. Seems like people got some spooky graves on the on the mind. Um, Okay, so for anybody who is just now joining us, this is Adler Astronomy Live. We are talking about sundials. We're looking at some of our amazing sundials from our collections. We have Dr. Sarah Schechner joining us, and we have our own Pedro Raposo, Dr. Pedro from uh, our own, he's our own curator here at the Adler. Um, Right now, I'm going to do a quick donation pitch. If you like this program and you want to see more programs like it, we would love it if you would consider donating to us uh, to help us while we are currently closed to the public. Any amount is welcome. Maybe it's $500 for the number of sundials we have in our collections, or maybe it's $29, which is a special number related to sundials in this program that we're going to talk about later. Uh, or maybe it's just $1. Any amount is welcome. Robert is gonna share the link for donating in the chats and we are so appreciative to everybody who has donated so far. All right, let's talk about some other types of portable sundials that could be easily carried around because those seem to be cool and in vogue. What are some other types of portable sundials out there? Yeah, sure. So let's talk about uh, another type which became quite popular in the late 17th century and the early 18th century. So going back to Sarah's point on all of the different devices that you find on the same piece and making it something uh, akin to a modern smartphone, now we're going to see, it begs the question, did people actually use all of those different devices? Just do we use all the apps we have in our smartphone at one time? So the piece we're going to see now, it's actually stripped down to, the, to a more basic uh, uh, design. So here it is. So this is called a Butterfield type sundial. It's made out of silver, comes in the small case so that you can carry it around. Note that there is prominently a compass and you already know what there is for to align the sundial by, uh, uh, with the local north-south line, the local meridian. You see several hour scales with Roman numerals and that triangular piece on the right is the gnomon. When you flip the sundial over, you will find what we call a gazetteer. Uh, so that's a list of cities with their respective latitudes. So you will have to adjust your sundial for your latitude and of course also align it with the local marine. Now going back to the upper side, 
of the sundial. Uh, Note the, the gnomon, which I'm going to, to set to a vertical position now. And you will certainly see a feature which is really a, a hallmark of this kind of sundials. There is a bird in the gnomon. So this kind of sundials named Butterfield sundial after Michael Butterfield. Michael Butterfield was an English instrument maker who in the mid 17th century went to Paris in France and set his instrument making workshop there. And we don't really think that perhaps he didn't come up with the general design because other instrument makers were already producing similar sundials, but the bird seems to have been one defining feature of this kind of sundial that, that he actually introduced. And this sundial became very popular and truly a trendsetter. So this bird is stylish. Is it functional? Yes, it is. Um, here's a detailed photo of it. And don't you just love that cute little bird? Yes. So his beak is pointing to uh, is a latitude scale, which runs from 40 degrees to 60 degrees. And that part of the gnomon is hinged so that you can um, incline it higher or lower by using the bird's beak to point to what your latitude is. Wow. So this allowed the sundown to be used at multiple latitudes by the maker, I mean, by the user. And depending on what latitude they were at, they would choose the right hour scale on the outside of the sundial to work with that gnomon position. And how would they know what latitude to suggest? Well, as we saw earlier, on the bottom, there is a gazetteer. And here you see a, a, a photo of the bottom and you see a list of cities. These are largely in France on this example, but we see Madrid and Milan and Rome and places elsewhere in Europe. Um, and next to these city names are two sets of numbers, which is the latitude and into both degrees and minutes. So this is pretty um, fine. And sometimes they just have the latitude of, in degrees alone. But um, so you would say, well, I'm in Vienna and I see the latitude is 48 degrees, 14 minutes. And then you would flip it over and move the bird gnome into 48 degrees. That's amazing. So whether you're traveling a bunch and you need to uh, carry this with you for that, or maybe you have a loved one that's traveling and you just want to know, like, what's their sun like right now? You can maybe check that out as well. Yes. I mean, th there's a lot of evidence that um, these were used both by travelers, but also that there was a lot of armchair traveling being done. So just because cities are listed on the gazetteer doesn't always mean that these were actually places the user would go, but they had the ability to go. It's again, like our smartphone, we, we might have a map uh, or an atlas on it. We could go see what the streets are like in Cairo, even if we never go there from Chicago. So it's, we, but we know if we did go, we could, we would have be able to use our instrument. And these were the bird gnomon were so popular that many different makers in Paris made them because they were just a fashion craze. And I mean, I want one, who doesn't want this? A cute <laughs> little bird gnomon. And they were such a craze that um, not only did other makers make them and sign you know, it, with their names, there were people who made forgeries of Butterfield's instruments and signed Butterfield's name to it. So it'd be like buying like, you know, a Rolex watch on a street corner for 10 bucks and you, you know, it's, it's a fake, but you get the style you like in a copycat version. And, um, or sometimes they're fakes that people, we don't know if people always knew they were getting a forgery. Um, and uh, they might've just been swindled. <laughs> so we have the same kind of economic issues back in the late 17th and 18th centuries that we have today with you know global economies. Yeah. 
Um, so we have a question here. This is so fine and detailed and somebody's asking how long would it take to make them so detailed? That's, that's really a good question. We, we don't have um, good data on that, I think. Um, there were, um, someone like Butterfield wasn't just one maker by himself in a workshop. Often there were other workers who helped and someone might have been responsible for engraving the cities on the back or someone making the compass and um, or doing the artistic engraving. And so it would take some time to make these. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the size of the workshop and the skills involved varied from maker to maker. Um, but even from the same shop, you see a lot of variation, which tells us that there, there, there's kind of, for, for this type, there's a lot of one off making one at a time. There are other times we see evidence of certain batch production, but the batches are still really small. We're talking like five instruments at a time. Mm. Um, so. So interesting. And then one real quick technical question. Is that a handle on the gazetteer side and does it have a function or is it a spring to keep the gnomon upright? It is what we're seeing there at the bottom is like we're seeing the underside of a foot, a little pedestal foot there. And then that engraved piece that looks like a vase with curlicues at the top. That is a spring. And so when it allows the gnomon on the other side, um, it has, so it has like a detent. So the gnomon can, you know, stay down when you want it down and it will stay up when you want it up. Provide some pressure for that. Nice guess, whoever asked that question. That's amazing. Okay, we got a question that is perfect to lead us into uh, the next thing we want to talk about, which they're asking, what is the best book with a large collection of pictures and descriptions of sundials. What is the best book? Pedro, I think you have one you'd like to tell us about. I have. So I, well, my favorite is a book titled Time of Our Lives, Sundials of the Other Planetarium. And the name of the author might sound familiar. So Dr. Sarah J. Schechner, our hey. special guest today. <laughs> this is actually the first part of a two volume catalog of our collection of roughly 500 sundials. Uh, 268 of our sundials are covered in this book. I want to remark that this is way more than a typical catalog of a collection. This is really a book that puts all of those pieces into context, uh, which explain the, the importance uh, of sundials in terms of culture, society, uh, uh, changes in mentalities, et cetera, et cetera. So really provides a very comprehensive pictures of sundials. Uh, goes into details of specific pieces, but placing them in this broad context. So if you've been enjoying the things you've been hearing so far, I strongly recommend that you get a copy of this book. Also because it's not only the result of Sarah's many years of extensive research on sundials, but it's also a beautiful book. It's lavishly illustrated. We worked with photographer Steve Pitkin to include high quality, finely detailed pictures of all of the sundials covered in this book. So it's really, it has become one of my bed, uh, uh, bedside table books now. So cool. And actually somebody already pitched this book in the chat. So there's a link to the book in the chats. Um, Robert can share it again too, if you need. Uh, please pick up this book, check it out. It's so beautiful. I mean, look at that cover. It It's so gorgeous. It reminds me of the cover of all my, uh, piano books growing up they always had like an instrument or like the close-up of like parts of the piano or like a metronome on the front and they're so pretty to look at um so yes check these out our very own special guest wrote this book all right so let's get back to spooky stuff because it's almost halloween and we haven't been spooky enough yet let's talk about that crucifix sundial again because there's so much to unpack here literally there is indeed Meredith. So I'm right now holding the sundial in my hand, as you can see in the video. It's made uh, out of a fine material, uh, gilt press, 
Uh, you see there's a nice uh, decoration showing the Virgin Mary. Uh, and of course, we call it a cruciform sundial, that meaning it comes in the shape of a cross. But it's actually more than a sundial. It is also a reliquary, that is a container that is used to keep relics associated with saints. Now you can see the inside of the reliquary and you will see me removing a little tiny wooden cross encased in gold, which at the time, this was made in Germany around 1560, at the time this would have been believed maybe to be a true piece of the cross in which Jesus was crucified. On the inside, on the ends of the cross, you see those clusters of pearls and gold filigrane. Those supposedly are wrapping fragments of bones of four saints. And right now you see me holding the strut that used to set the sundial to a desired latitude. So you see on the other part of the sundial, uh, you see there's a compass, again, to align the sundial with the local meridian. There's a latitude uh, uh, scale, and then you place the strut in the desired latitude. And this is roughly how the sundial looks when it's set to find the time. But now folks might be asking, okay, but, uh, there's an hour scale, there's a nomen, where is that stuff? So in this case, note that the sides of the reliquary uh, actually have an hour scale. And so the edges of the head and the arms of the cross will function themselves as the nomen. So it's the shadow of the cross itself on that hour scale you see on the sides that will tell you the time. Unreal. This thing is jam-packed. It has a little piece of what is supposed to be Jesus's cross in there and real bones from four saints. It's gorgeous to look at. I'm assuming it could be worn around the neck. So who would own such a precious, precious piece like this? Who got to wear this or own it or carry it around with them? It was probably owned by a bishop or cardinal in the Catholic Church. We see on the side that's standing up, there's an engraving of a bishop or a man in a bishop's hat and with um, various flowers associated with the Virgin Mary. And on the other side in the video, we saw how the Virgin Mary was on that part. So with the loop on the top, you could wear this around your neck. It'd be a little big for a woman. It probably belonged to a bishop. Um, he could have also had it strung off his belt. So it would be a way to keep these saintly relics with him to um, call on their power or meaning and also to find the time of day. Um, and with this clever way of the cross, one arm casting the shadow on this adjacent side. Um, this one tells time in equal hours. The church often used unequal hours, which are um, hours that changed their lengths um, to longer or shorter, depending on the time of year. Um, and I see there was a question in the chat about this. So this kind of sundial, the hours would have been the same length no matter what season, you would just have fewer of them in the winter of daylight than in the summer. But um, the church often used hours that were um, unequal. So they were like sponges. So you always had 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night, no matter what time of year. And like sponges, they got fatter in the summer, <laughs> these hours, and they shrunk up and they dried up in the winter. And um, the church, scheduled the times of its prayers according to these unequal hours. So religious dials like this often have another scale of hours for the, the times of prayer, but you could still work with the equal hours for that purpose too. That is so cool. And thank you for answering that question. Cause when I saw that, I was like, I really want to know the answer to that. And I started thinking in my mind, like, how does that even work? Um, okay, so you're talking, you were talking about specifically the Catholic Church. And, <laughs> and I mean, this is the kind of stuff that they would have. Also, like having bones of saints is apparently a very normal thing that I remember the first time I learned about it going to visit like an old cathedral in Europe, I was like, what's this hand doing here on display? Um, but let's talk about some other religions and other faiths. Uh, what kind of devices would they have? Well, um, 
just a lot of religions have um, requirements about the times of prayer. And for the Muslim faith, they have a requirement that you also need to orient yourself in the direction of Mecca and the holy mosque there in the center. So there was a type of sundial and instrument combination that served this purpose for Muslims is known as a Qibla indicator. And here we see a picture of one. And um, you have a um, compass there for orienting <clears throat> the sundial. And there's a little pin on in the center just below the compass that's tipped over now, but you would stand it up and it would sh show the hour hours on those scales for times of prayer. And then um, what Pedro is moving right now is a very fancy index um, shaped like a plant um, that points to uh, directions um, with respect to the compass. Now that would be used for orienting yourself in the right direction of Mecca. On the underside here, we see a gazetteer of cities and listed next to them are not only their latitudes, but a compass direction of the mosque in Mecca. So you would know um, from where you were, you could look up um, what city you were in, set up the sundial for that place and know, and move that index to point in the right direction so you would orient yourself properly for the prayers. So it's, this could be used also by travelers who were of the Muslim faith. It's so beautiful. It's like a little table that you just carry around with you. Um, I love it. Uh, somebody is asking if it's possible for everyday people to make just their own little sundial. Um, that's not too technical or complex. Like, and they give the example, could, could I dig a hole in a sunny spot in the ground, uh, cement a stick and get the time of day? <laughs> <laughs> you could, um, if you had your stick um, oriented in the right direction to go with the hour lines you were going to mark on the ground. So the two need to work together. Uh, but yes, they're very simple sundials you can make, um, and there are various um, uh, online, various tutorials or things you can download and print a paper and just fold up and you have a sundial. Um, but it's very instructive. I mean, I urge you, go out and stick a stick in the ground. That's that's a gnomon. And, and, you know, have a, or something vertical on a piece of paper with, rings on it, say you might put your stick or standing up pen cap or something in the middle of a piece of paper that has concentric rings and, and a line going straight down and um, start noticing where the shower, the shadow is and mark it on which ring it's touching. And then come back a bit later and notice where the shadow is again and mark that and how long it is. And through the course of the day, you'll notice the shadow is not only moving um, from west to east, as the sun in the sky is moving from east to west, but the shadow is, is very long at the early part of the day and the end of the day, and it gets much shorter towards noon. So it's changing direction and in length. And all that is information you can use not only to find true north and south, but for your without a compass, but also to uh, begin to find the hours of the day. So cool. And sundials are ancient, ancient devices. I mean, I think that's what makes it so cool is just how, you know, they were so useful for so long. Um, let's take a look at some more sundials. In that beginning uh, little collage that you showed with three, I, there was the one that was cubey and cool. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to talk about that sundial and how it possibly works. <laughs> sure, well, we call it simply a cube sundial, uh, which basically tells you it's self-explanatory because it comes uh, in the shape of a cube. We're going to see an animation and the cube sundial we'll see in the animation is specifically called a portable cube sundial, just because yes, you can use it in different 
places. So uh, here in the animation, you'll see that there are actually one sundial on each of five faces of the cube. So you can see that in the image. So the other face will actually be attached to a pillar that uh, uh, holds the sundial and the pillar is connected with a base. Uh, you can also see a plumb line in the weight. So that's, that you use to set your sundial for a desired latitude. Now you'll be able to see the base. Look, there's a compass. Again, you will have to align your sundial with the local meridian, the north-south line. Here we are seeing the west facing side of the sundial. So throughout the day, you'll see the shadow progressing uh, on the hour scales showing uh, the, the hours going by. So here we are looking at the afternoon hours progressing on the west facing side of the sundial. Wow. What's really cool about this um, west face is you saw the image of Father Time or Kronos and um, this gets back to our spooky Halloween aspects. Yes. Because he's, he's holding a scythe and he's got a hat that is a sand glass, just so we, and here's another sundial at the other planetarium that's made of silver and also has this feature on the Western face. And so there's no mistaking who this guy is. Um, with the scythe and the little sand glass hat. But he's there on the Western side of the sundial, I believe, to remind people as, as the day is coming to a close and hours are passing that we should use our time wisely. Um, again, this is this reminder of death and passage of time and you know that we should get our acts together. <laughs> Yes. And uh, um, these kind of memento more reminders of death um, do feature on sundials quite a bit. Sometimes you may have a, a, a little boy leaning on a skull, you know, <laughs> like sleeping on the sundial and you're like, oh, OK, I shouldn't be doing that. You know, so um, there they are. Uh, they can be creepy, but they also can be quite interesting. Yeah, who knew that we would have so much spooky content today talking about sundials. Um, so it's interesting to me that there's so many sundials within a sundial here, Pedro. Uh, how many sundials do we ever get up to? Well, in, in fact, there's no limit really as much as you can fit in. Now we're going to, to see another piece from our collections. I'll say that the cube sundial is a particular case of what we call a polyhedral sundial, which is basically a sundial with many faces and each face can have one or even more sundials. So this piece, which you are, are looking at now, this was made in the early 17th century in Germany. Uh, and this is actually, it's one sundial, but in fact, it contains Actually, 29 sundials is truly an over-engineered piece. You'll note there's a little insert made out of ivory. That will be the compass. So you would have to, again, align your sundial with the north-south line. This is designed for the latitude of 50 degrees. And then, of course, you'll have different faces, which will be hit by sunlight throughout the day. The idea here is that you have different kinds of sundials. Uh, some are set to give different types of hours, as uh, Sarah explained in the beginning. The idea being that if everything is properly designed and constructed, you will always see the correct time being given by the sundials that are exposed to the sun, when the sundial is properly set in the line. And we have a metal version of this as well, right? We do have a metal version, indeed, which we also believe uh, was made uh, in Germany in, uh, in the early 17th century as well. And here you can see that piece again. In this case, it's a finer material. This is made out of, uh, of silver. And, and again, you can see it's very similar. Again, you have all the different types of sundials uh, in the various faces. In this case, you have a round recess where you have a compass to align the sundial. And yes, the concept is very much the same and the design is very much the same. And we actually believe that they go back to the same source. Wait, how many total, Pedro? How many sundials? 29 too. 20, so 
we mentioned 29 earlier was going to be a special important number. Here it is. That's the big reveal. Look at this thing. It's so amazing. Um, okay. So uh, like, what is the purpose of producing such a complex sundial like this, Sarah? Well, it's a show off piece, you know, mm -hmm. it's like a dissertation on mathematical astronomy um, to show off one's virtuosity to engrave all these sundials, or if you're the owner to be able to use all these sundials. Um, as we said, there are 29 different ones on this piece. And um, one way I like to think of it is like a kind of um, Renaissance Rube Goldberg machine. So <laughs> yes. it's like, as the sun moves across the sky, one sundial on the piece hands off to the next one. And it's something is always finding the time. And um, do we need 29 different ways to find the time? No, uh, it's, as I said, it's, it's to someone to own to show how smart they are or you know, to um, give evidence of their education and breeding or kind of a display of how good you could solve various puzzles. Yeah, absolutely. We have somebody asking who would have owned this and I think you nailed it. Um, and also they did mention that it is majestic. <laughs> yes, okay, so and here we see the book that it, um, by Orange Fien, um, this is a 1560 edition of one of his works. And even an earlier book of his also had the same sundial in it. So we think, you know, this is a book about how to make sundials and the author who's a French mathematician is kind of showing off in the book. And we think that this source must have inspired the makers, the maker of these two sundials. It's very, unusual to have two like this <laughs> um, and uh, and know the source. That's so cool seeing them next to each other. Somebody has been asking about uh, daylight savings time. Um, do these account for daylight savings time? And also somebody else is asking about clock time. So is daylight savings more of a clock thing? And when did clocks kind of replace some dials? How are they related? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can talk a bit about that. Actually, so the first mechanical clocks emerged in the, in, the, in the Middle Ages, in the 14th century, but it was really only in the 17th century that we started to see imported advancements uh, in clocks. But the fact is, it took a long time before everyone could have a reliable clock. And in fact, sundials and clocks coexisted uh, well until into the 19th century. And in fact, normally, Sundials will be even more precise than the available clocks and people would set their clocks by sundials. Uh, so what happens is that when you use a clock and the sundial, you have to make corrections because the apparent motion of the sun on the celestial sphere, which of course is due to the orbital motion of the earth, is not uniform. So you have so astronomers and mathematicians came up with this concept of a, a theoretical sun the mean sun that has an apparent uniform motion. And so that's the reference for clocks, which means that normally when you get the time from a sundial, you have to apply a correction, which is called the equation of time. So daylight savings, it's a later development, which mm -hmm. uh, the idea was already around in the, in the 18th century, but it really gained track uh, during the Great War as a way of, uh, of uh, saving energy and having uh, making a better use of the period of, of daylight. But yeah, so when, if you are going to use a sundial, you have to take this all into account. And also the fact that nowadays we use time zones. So we're not, we do not regulate our lives by our local time. And in fact, there's an international coordination of time. So yeah, there are several steps that you have to take in order to get the correct time from a sundial to your clock. I want to emphasize though that uh, sundials have been placed in, uh, in public spaces uh, so that people could uh, um, actually set their clocks by the sundials. And there was one specific type of sundial, which is extremely inter interesting because it was a loud one. It told people the time literally with the blast. And we're going to see one of such sundials right now. 
which as you can see is more than a sundial because it also includes a cannon, a gun. So this is what we call a cannon dial. And this became much appreciated from the late 18th century onwards. Wow, this is so cool. How does it work, Sarah? So the cannon, you put some gunpowder in like a touch hole at one end of the cannon. And then every day you plan to use it, you would go out um, and adjust those arms that are attached to the quadrants and the arms that are carrying this burning lens, a kind of magnifying lens at the top. And that lens um, focuses light on the touch hole of the cannon. Um, but you need to have it set at the right angle for the sun at noon on the given day that you're planning to use it. So we have the, um, uh, so this would be set up in a park say, and um, you someone would come up and put the gunpowder in and set the, lens at the right angle for the sun on that day. And then at noon, the light from the sun would be focused on the cannon. And at precisely noon, you would get a, the cannon would fire. Wow. You, so it's acoustical sundial. Um, and uh, they're, they were set up in various parks, particularly in places like London and Paris and people would stand around to watch the signal gun go off. And often people would set their watches to that. And of course, kids enjoyed it. It was, you know, great fun. Who doesn't want to watch a cannon blow off? Yeah, it's so fun and cool. Um, okay, so we are running low on time, but are sundials still relevant today? Do we still use them? Well, of course, they are still relevant. Actually, uh, just outside the Adler, we have a public sundial, which is also a work of public art. Uh, this is a sculpture by the British artist Henry Moore. Uh, it's titled Man Enters the Cosmos. It's a sculpture, but it's actually a fully functional sundial. So you can see in the image that thin rod that rests at, uh, on the ends of the vertical crescent is the gnomon, and on the other crescent you have an hour scale. So this is actually a type of sundial that we call an equatorial sundial. This was placed next to the Adler in 1980 to celebrate our 50th anniversary. It's wow. made out of cast bronze and actually uh, uh, more gave it a, a, a golden patina to highlight that those 50 years, those first 50 years of the Adler uh, from 1940 to 1980 were a golden age of uh, advancements in astronomy and space exploration. So you will find, so, so we have heard today about sundials maybe in graves, sundials in gardens. And I want to emphasize that originally the concept for this sundial, and there's actually a similar piece in Belgium, uh, in, in the area of Brussels, so Henry Moore came, with, came up with this concept because he made a sundial for his own garden. And this is a great reminder that sundials have always been at the intersection between art and science. And I'm pretty sure that that came out very evidently uh, in today's conversation. And to this day, there are people to the question uh, to expand on Sarah said about the person who asked, can I make sundials? Answer is yes, you can. There are people still today rejoicing, collecting and making their own sundials. And there are even societies and groups that bring together people who want to share their passion about sundials. One of such groups, which I want to mention is the North American Sundial Society. Uh, to, and we are grateful uh, to the North American Sundial Society because they supported the publication of, of our wonderful book, Time of Our Lives, authored by Sarah Schechner. And again, which I would like to recommend to everyone. Yes, check it out. Robert's gonna share that link again. Oh, this has been such an awesome program today. I love looking at all these different sundials. Who knew that there'd be so many, that so many of them are kind of spooky, that we're all getting a little spooky thinking about sundials. Who knew? Thank you, everybody, for attending Astro Adler Astronomy Live this week. You know, we have one every two weeks-ish. So uh, don't forget to subscribe and also turn on that little bell so that it lets you know next time that we have one of these videos. We love it when you all come and ask us questions. They're so fun. Thank you to Dr. Sarah Schechner for joining us today all the way from Massachusetts. Sarah, it was such a pleasure. 
Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, so much fun. And of course, Pedro, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Sarah. It's been wonderful. Yeah. Thank you everyone who was with us. Yeah. Yes, and of course to Mark Subarau, who you can't see, but he has been running this entire Zoom and showing us all our amazing visualizations. Thank you to Mark. If we didn't get to all your questions, please reach out to us using askadler at adlerplanetarium.org. Send us an email and one of our experts will get back to you as soon as possible. Also, Robert's going to be sharing a link uh, to a survey. Please let us know how are you enjoying our program? What would you like to see more of? Um, and Robert's also going to once more share the link for donating so that we can keep programs like this going forever and ever. Um, thank you, everybody, so much. And we'll see you in a couple weeks. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.